All right. So thank you again, everybody, for being here. And up next, we have Sue Garrity. She's going to talk about emergency rooms and orthopedics and persons with bleeding disorders. So welcome, Sue Garrity, for being with us today. Appreciate it. Thanks, Sue. So I'd like to thank everybody for hanging in there on a Saturday morning. And um, thanks to Sue for inviting me and HFA for sponsoring me. So I'm going to talk this morning a little bit about um, things that bring our bleeding disorder patients to the emergency room and also to orthopedic doctors, um, surgeons to um, get their bleeding disorder issues addressed. So with that, oh, there we go. Um, since HFA is sponsoring um, my talk and also sponsored Dr. O'Brien's talk, um, they asked that we just tell you a little bit about who they are. They were founded in 1994, so they've been around for quite a while, and they're a very patient-centric organization. So they're looking at assisting and advocating for people in the bleeding disorder community. And advocacy is a big part of what they do, um, both on a local and on a national level, to ensure that our patients with bleeding disorders get what they need um, through the political realms as well as through the medical realms. And these are some of their, the sponsors for programs such as the one you're gonna to hear today. So our objectives for this morning are to gain an understanding of what issues might bring a patient with a bleeding disorder to the emergency department and how to assess um, those patients once they hit the door at the ER. And this is gonna also include things, I know there are some um, consumers listening in this morning. And these are some things, some takeaway points that you can know um, so that you in turn can be prepared if you have to visit an emergency department or if you're going in to see an orthopedic surgeon. Um, we're gonna talk about why patients with hemophilia um, are gonna seek care from an orthopedic surgeon. And then we're gonna talk lastly about some of the surgeries that may be beneficial to um, patients in our bleeding disorder community. So this is the outline that I'm going to cover this morning. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Davis for providing an excellent groundwork on hemophilia and bleeding disorders. And I also want to say an aside, there are parts of the talk where I may say specifically hemophilia. Um, keep in mind that also um, pertains to patients with severe von Willebrand's disease, um, patients with severe platelet disorders. Um, so even though I come from the old school, I've been in bleeding disorder care for over 30 years. And so, um, and that was a time when we really did focus just on hemophilia. As you've heard this morning, we've really um, broadened our scope of the patients that we care for today. And so um, I apologize to any of those listening who have another bleeding disorder. I don't mean to um, avoid your talk, you know, I'll try to use bleeding disorder when I can, let me put it that way. Um, so we're gonna talk, uh, as I mentioned about the emergency room, we're also gonna talk about why orthopedics plays a role. Um, Dr. O'Brien talked um, very extensively about how OBGYN play a role for our women with bleeding disorders. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about orthopedics. And lastly, we'll cover some of those orthopedic surgeries that um, especially those of our patients in um, adult patients may be seeking care for um, in the future. So we're gonna start off by talking about the emergency room and emergencies for patients with bleeding disorders. And then about halfway through, we're gonna switch gears and start talking about um, orthopedics. So what types of things bring patients with bleeding disorders to an emergency room? They're the same things oftentimes that bring anyone to an emergency department. Um, being involved in a motor vehicle accident, a trauma, falling off a ladder, um, getting evaluated for a medical issue. Do you have appendicitis? Um, Dr. Davis showed us a picture of someone with a retroperitoneal um, bleed. Is the patient having an, ap needs an appendectomy or do they just need treatment for a retroperitoneal hemorrhage? So, um, a patient may show up in your emergency department um, for evaluation. Is this appendicitis? Are they having a gallbladder attack? These are things all people end up in the emergency room for. Um, pain that's not being resolved with the normal um, things that a, a consumer uses in the home setting for pain relief. Um, feeling ill, 
And this has become particularly important over the last year um, for patients who potentially think they may have COVID, especially before all the on-site, you know, um, COVID testing places have um, popped up. But for those who are sick, they're going to end up in the emergency room and often end up admitted um, for their COVID issues. And then lastly, patients show up in the emergency room because they just know they're not well. They don't know what's wrong. They're not sure what's wrong. So they're seeking advice from healthcare professionals. In addition to those things that bring everybody, excuse me, everybody to an emergency department, we're also looking at what specific things bring our patients with bleeding disorders to the emergency room. So specifically bleeding related issues. So uncontrolled bleeding. So um, as you heard, our our patients in the bleeding disorder community are very well educated and they have most of the time a plan of care that they implement at home on the advice of their hematologist or HTC. When that bleeding is not responding to their home plan, that bleeding can become uncontrolled and they end up in an emergency room. And one of the biggest things that bring our patients with bleeding disorders to emergency rooms are that um, significant epistaxis. We heard that um, epistaxis that lasts longer than 10 minutes is significant. Um, and it is common in patients without bleeding disorders, but it can be very common in our patients with bleeding disorders. Um, Another thing that brings our patients to the emergency room, I don't know if many of you um, listened to Hunter yesterday. He talked about possibly having to go to the emergency room to um, have them place um, an IV for him when he was getting factor. Um, many of our patients don't have great veins. Um, and this can be especially true in our small children. We've kind of come full circle. Um, we used to use a lot of venous access devices like forts and Broviac catheters in our very young children. And we're trying to get away from that today. So um, we are spending a lot more time at the hemophilia treatment centers teaching parents how to start their own IVs on their, their young children. But sometimes the veins are small, the child's dehydrated, parents are frustrated, they've stuck their child a couple of times. So they may seek help, especially on a day like today. It's Saturday, the hemophilia treatment center is not open. Um, it's their, their child's day to, to get an infusion or their child's experience a bleeding episode, and they need help from healthcare professionals. And then our older or more mild patients who don't infuse on, on a regular basis um, often can run into trouble accessing their veins. And again, this can be true, especially of a lot of our older um, patients who relied on either a spouse or a parent to be their infuser infusers, and they didn't get proficient in it themselves. Now that person who was infusing them may no longer be with us, and they're kind of between a rock and a hard place. They know they need to be infused, but they also feel like they can't do it themselves. So they're gonna seek care in an emergency department. And then, um, as I mentioned, we do use still to this day, um, some patients have venous access devices and our patients are, are educated and they know if they have a fever that that's not normal, that they shouldn't have a fever or shaking chills after their port or, or line has been accessed. So they're instructed to immediately go to an emergency room. Again, um, they may call a healthcare provider, um, their HTC um, ahead of time, but they're still gonna need to be evaluated. And lastly, patients aren't sure if they're having a bleed. They may be weekend warriors and out playing soccer or doing something and tweak their knee. Um, they're with their buddies and their buddy says, oh, you probably just sprained your medial, medial collateral ligament. You don't need to go to the emergency room. But you don't know if it's just a ligament sprain or a bleed. And in our patients with bleeding disorders, a ligament sprain, um, injured muscle, equate to a bleed. So, um, but oftentimes our patients aren't sure. So they're gonna show up in an emergency department to get clarification as to whether or not they're actually bleeding. <laughs> and then lastly, there are true emergencies in our patients with bleeding disorders that will take them um, to an emergency department. 
um, head trauma with the potential of intracranial hemorrhage, neck or throat hemorrhages that um, can lead to airway obstruction, that intra abdominal or retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Um, we've heard compartment syndrome mentioned today, and then post-surgical bleeding. And this also pertains to postpartum hemorrhage as Dr. O'Brien talked about. Um, when we look at patients with bleeding disorders coming to the emergency department, um, we as healthcare providers in the bleeding disorder um, realm really would like you to treat first and then complete your assessment. And I think we heard that from Dr. Davis this morning. Um, we want to give the patient appropriate therapy as quickly as possible. And what I always tell my families is, you know, it doesn't matter if you're deficient in factor eight or factor nine or von Willebrand's protein and somebody gives you a dose of your clotting protein, it's not going to hurt you because you're deficient. All it did was make you like the rest of us that are walking around with normal factor eight or factor nine. So it doesn't hurt. And sometimes our um, emergency room docs and other um, healthcare providers want to confirm that the patient's actually having a bleeding or a bleeding episode, um, especially intracranial hemorrhages. You know, if your calf is swollen or your ankle swollen, that's a visual thing we can see, but we can't see bleeding in our brain. And oftentimes healthcare providers in that emergency setting want that reassurance that there is a bleed before they give this expensive medication. And we're saying on the, the hematology side, give the factor, then let's see if they really have a bleed. Um, and the other thing we see is it doesn't take a lot of trauma. A lot of times people say, well, you barely hit your head. Why are you here in my emergency department? And we know that patients with bleeding disorders can have significant intracranial hemorrhage with very minimal trauma. And then lastly, um, again, I think Dr. Davis um, talked a little bit about this, is you're seeing an infant that has no history of hemophilia. So um, you're looking at the, the patient saying, well, this can't be a bleeding disorder because there is no family history. And as you've heard repetitively um, throughout the, this weekend, 30% of our cases of hemophilia are new mutations. And so maintain a high suspicion that hemophilia um, could be a differential diagnosis in a male patient with significant bleeding. We've also heard that PT and PTT um, are screening laboratory tests that can be very helpful in um, helping you decide whether or not this patient, regardless of what you're treating them for in the emergency room today, will need a referral to a hematologist um, for further evaluation and workup. And that can be um, at a hemophilia treatment center, as Dr. O'Brien said. Um, if you're not sure what the patient has, go ahead and refer them to us. We're happy to do that workup and figure out whether or not this patient has a bleeding disorder. Your priority is to help the patient while they're there in your emergency department. And our priority is to help them get that treatment plan that they can keep at home so that they don't land in your emergency department again. Um, first and foremost, as I mentioned, we wanna replace that missing clotting factor. But keep in mind, especially those of you who practice in more rural settings, um, not all hospitals carry factor concentrate and you may have, have to obtain it either from a blood bank or from another facility. Um, if your facility does not keep factor and the family brings their factor in, use it. It's better to use something. And our patients, again, are very well educated. They know how to store their factor at home. Um, and I've had instances where um, emergency rooms say, okay, you can use your factor, but we're not going to give it. We'll, we'll put the IV in, but because you are the one who had the factor, we're going to make you give it because we don't want to be responsible for how you stored it at home. But I can assure those of you listening, our patients do take this very seriously. They understand how expensive the treatment product they have is, and they do store it according to um, the instructions that they've been given. Um, if your facility does have factor, try to accommodate the patient's request for a certain type. And pretty much, I'm talking type classes. We have, when I started in hemophilia, there were three or four brands of factor out there. Now we have 20 plus different types of factor. But what we really want to do is accommodate whether or not the patient 
needs a recombinant factor, which is a genetically engineered factor, or a plasma-derived factor. Most of our patients with von Willebrand's disease are still using a plasma-derived factor. While there is one recombinant um, von Willebrand's product on the market, it's not readily carried in most emergent or in most hospitals. Um, and then keep in mind, if it's a true emergency, any factor is better than none. So if your facility only has plasma-derived factor, then it's okay to give it. That's better than not giving anything at all. The caveat to that is, as I said, there is only one recombinant von Willebrand protein. So giving recombinant factor eight to a patient with von Willebrand um, is not really gonna be helpful. It may be slightly helpful, but it's not gonna be hugely helpful. And this is where having a two-way dialogue with that patient's regular healthcare provider or hematologist is gonna be very important. And um, if you were listening yesterday, you met the hematologists that run the hemophilia treatment centers in South Carolina, and any of them or their partners would be happy to be contacted on a Saturday morning if you are seeing one of their patients. Um, and lastly, in a true emergency, I know I am from Colorado. That's where I practiced. We were responsible for Wyoming and Montana. There's a lot of land out there and a lot of very small hospitals that have no access and are four, five, six hours from getting factor for a patient. So um, in a true emergency, using fresh frozen plasma for those patients who are factor nine deficient or cryoprecipitate for patients who are um, factor eight or have von Willebrand's, um, it can be used in life-threatening situ situations when there is no factor available. And this will just buy you a little bit of time to get that factor concentrate for your patient. Other things to be aware of, as I mentioned, our patients and their families are well-educated in their disease state. And this may be the first time you're ever seeing a patient with hemophilia in your emergency department. Listen to what the patient has to say. This can significantly help reduce morbidity and mortality. And um, again, as you heard from, um, I think both Dr. Davis and um, Dr. O'Brien, up to one half of women who are carriers of hemophilia have low factor levels and should be treated like their male counterparts. Um, we used to use the term symptomatic carriers. Today, we're trying to get away from using that term and actually calling these women who have low factor levels um, hemophiliacs as well. But for by and large, those of us, especially those in my generation who were trained, we were taught hemophilia. If we were taught at all about hemophilia, we were taught it was an X-linked inherited disorders. Men have it, women carry it. Therefore, women can't have hemophilia. So what I've tried to do over time with my women who are affected um, carriers is to say to an emergency room physician, I am a carrier of hemophilia. I have a low factor eight level and um, this is my factor eight level. And our patients can be, be relied upon to be fairly accurate in the information that they relay to you in the emergency department. Um, Patients seen at hemophilia treatment centers, as I think Dr. Davis mentioned, they have a letter we had um, at the hemophilia center in Denver, we had bleeding alert cards. And we encouraged our patients or their parents to carry that bleeding alert card in their wallet. It had the patient's name, their date of birth, their diagnosis, their treatment product, and whether or not they had an inhibitor. So, um, they may have a card, they may have a letter, ask for that if you're seeing a patient. Um, they may very well have it, but because of the um, anxiety or that brought them or the issue that brought them to the emergency room, they may forget to give that to you. So again, ask for it. And in most cases, hemophilia treatment centers have 24 hour consultative services to help you help our patients. The person you get on the phone may not be that person's physician, but they also are going to know how to guide you in the treatment of that patient. So these are all just things to be um, cognizant of when you're taking care of a patient with a bleeding disorder in your emergency department. Um, again, most of our patients do know their diagnosis, but not all of them. They may say, I know I have hemophilia, but do they know if they're factor eight or factor nine deficient? Um, again, that call to their healthcare provider is going to help um, solve that mystery. 
undiagnosed patients. Um, these patients are usually the patients that have mild hemophilia or von Willebrand's disease or no family history. Um, we heard how um, Dr. Davis did a very nice presentation in terms of the PT-PTT. If you have a prolonged PT, that's more than likely you're going to travel down the road of factor seven deficiency. The, a prolonged PTT may guide you more towards looking at von Willebrand's factor eight or factor nine deficiency. And then if you have prolongation of both the PT and PTT, you're going to um, look for some of those more exotic um, bleeding disorders like factor two, factor 10, factor 13, which are extremely rare. And then undiagnosed children who present with bruising or bleeding to an emergency department, um, while their, their bleeding needs to be treated, they may be considered for non-accidental injury um, or um, you know, those bruises that are in parts of their body where kids don't usually run into things. Um, so we're not saying as hematologists or health or hemophilia treatment center providers that you should dismiss um, the, the question of whether there's non-accidental trauma. But as a nurse, I can tell you getting that call from a parent whose child has been put in custody of social services when they are diagnosed is scary. But if your child has not been diagnosed, it can be scary because you know as a parent, you haven't done anything wrong, but yet the healthcare providers in the emergency room are saying, this looks like you know, you're abusing your child. So again, it's a fine line. We want your child to get the best care possible, but we also don't want healthcare providers to jump the gun and automatically assume this is non-accidental trauma when it actually could be a bleeding disorder. Um, we heard about emicizumab. This is the mimetic that um, mimics the role of factor eight in the clotting cascade. It can be used for patients with and without inhibitors. Um, as Dr. Davis said, do not give a second dose. This is not factor. This is a prophylactic medication. Um, so these patients who are on this medication who present in the emergency room with bleeding, um, are going to need, if they do not have an inhibitor, factor eight or factor nine, if they do have an inhibitor, you're going to want to have that two-way communication again with their healthcare provider to determine what the best treatment product for those patients are. And again, as was mentioned earlier today, any of the PTT-based um, studies, such as factor eight assay or inhibitors, are not accurate for patients that are using this particular medication. <laughs> So in summary, just want you all to know that persons with bleeding disorders will access care in an emergency department, both for things that are emergencies for everyone and for things that are emergency specific to their bleeding disorder. Um, remember to treat the bleeding disorder first and then follow up with your complete assessment of the problem. I'm not saying that you shouldn't assess the patient when they come to your emergency department, but what I am saying is let's do a cursory assessment get the factor in them, and then let's do that head CT, that x-ray of, of the tibia, whatever else you need to do to formulate and come up with exactly what's going on with the patient. And um, have a two-way conversation, both with the patient and their family, because they are very well-versed in their bleeding disorder, and with their regular hematologists, especially with these cases such as intracranial hemorrhage, patients on emicizumab, inhibitor patients. Those patients are going to best be served by you having that two-way conversation with the people who typically take care of them. And with that, I'm going to switch gears here. And now we're going to talk a little bit about orthopedic issues and some of the things that will bring a patient with a bleeding disorder to see that orthopedist or orthopedic surgeon. So we heard a little bit earlier about hemophilic arthropathy. What is it? Well, it's the most common complication in hemophilia. Inhibitors are the most severe complication, but joint bleeding and hemophilic arthropathy are the most common complication. And this is recurrent joint bleeding. Um, oftentimes it's re referred to as hemothrosis. Um, if you go back to the Latin room, roots, heme, blood, arthrosis, or arthro joint, um, so bleeding into the joint. And then um, 
that bleeding into the joint then leads to chronic synovitis. And that in turn will lead, lead to arthropathy. So acute hemarthrosis is what leads us to start young children on prophylaxis. Um, you can see this little guy on the left-hand side, he's toddling around and we know toddlers lead with their head, they fall, you know, and they're gonna get their first joint bleed. Um, usually in and around, it's very surprising that children with severe hemophilia have not had their first joint bleed by the time they're age two. Um, depicted on the other side of the slide, however, is what we see in our adult patients who weren't offered the benefit of this prophylaxis at an early age. They've had repeat acute hemarthrosis into joints, and this can often lead to a need for orthopedic surgery down the road. And you can see this gentleman has both varus and valgus deformities of his legs. His right ankle is turned out. He doesn't straighten his elbows. So he has flexion contractures in both elbows. So just looking at this gentleman who um, at the time was 58 years old, he had five of his six index joints affected by bleeding. <laughs> And what happens with those index joints, which are ankles, knees, and elbows, those are the most common joints um, that our patients with bleeding disorders bleed into. And that's pretty obvious. Our ankles and knees, our legs are our weight bearing. And so those joints bear the weight. Um, we do see bleeding into hips as well, but not as common as ankles and knees. And then upper extremities. Um, just think how many times you bend your elbow during the day. Um, so elbow joints um, bleed frequently, not to say that shoulders don't also bleed, but um, bleeding can occur in any joint. So um, it can occur in finger, fingers, it can occur in big toes, it can occur in your back. Um, we don't often think about our backs being a series of joints, but um, those are all places where bleeding can occur. But by and large, most of the bleeding takes place in our, those index joints, ankles, knees, and elbows. And what happens is the patient gets a bleed, and um, the bleed resolves. And then the next time they get a bleed, and maybe they didn't get treatment as quickly, um, that lining of the joint proliferates. And then eventually, you have um, damage to the articular cartilage in the joint. So here, this is an uh, x-ray of a perfectly normal knee. You can see um, nice smooth joint space, nice and wide. And this picture is what happens when you have repeated bleeding over and over and over again. That nice wide joint space that you see here is gone. And now you have very, very limited joint space. In some places, there's actually bone on bone. So severe hemarthrosis occurs in patients with severe hemophilia, makes sense. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, in patients between the ages of two to eight, about 10% of them have experienced um, significant joint bleeding. As you get older, you take on more activities, um, you're doing more sports, um, nine to 12, about 30% of our patients with severe hemophilia have had hemarthrosis. And then um, by the time um, guys reach late adolescence, almost 40% of them have had joint bleeding. Um, and this is despite even our good care that we can provide today. So even though we've made lots of strides in how we manage hemophilia, our patients still are having some joint issues. Um, as I mentioned earlier, frequent joint bleeding can um, lead to synovitis. Those synovial changes, again, precede the cartilage changes. And there's an accumulation of iron in that synovial tissue. And that is thought to be um, the cause of some of the synovial inflammation. That hemosiderin is brownish in color. Um, I've been in the OR when um, an orthopedic surgeon has opened up a knee and all of this profuse um, enlarged synovium is there and it's all brown and kind of icky looking. So it happens. And um, I've also heard orthopedic surgeons say, gosh, I had never seen anything like that when I got in the OR and, and looked at this joint. So um, unless you've seen hemophilic arthropathy, 
it may be a shock to you as to how significant the changes are that you're seeing in this joint, whether you're looking through an arthroscope or you actually are doing an arthrotomy. Um, eventually, this chronic bleeding will lead to damage of the articular cartilage, and this is both due to direct exposure of blood and that inflammation that happens. And what we see is kind of a combination between rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. The inflammation and synovial hypertrophy that we see in our hemophilia patients um, is very similar to that um, that you see in a rheumatoid patient. And then those progressive degenerative changes of the hyaline cartilage um, are closer to what we see in osteoarthritis. So um, it's kind of a combination of both types of arthritis. And again, this is just a schematic of what I was talking about. Um, the patient has hemorrhage. They end up with synovial inflammation, which leads to chronic hemarthrosis, which then leads to synovial hypertrophy. That synovium gets bigger. It gets, in, gets impinged or pinched when you move the joint. And then that whole cycle starts again. And eventually, after repeated um, you know, circulation of that, that particular cycle, um, we end up with that um, articular cartilage change and end-stage arthropathy. So um, oftentimes, hemophilia treatment centers work closely with a particular orthopedic surgeon, um, or not all hemophilias have someone on staff. And just like um, every other specialty, um, when I started in hemophilia, we had one surgeon and that we used um, frequently and that orthopedic surgeon did elbows, he did total joint replacements, he did ankle fusions, he did everything. But as time's gone on, orthopedic surgeons, just like everyone else, have specialized. So the hemophilia treatment center may have several hemophilia are several orthopedists um, that they use for referral. And then patients may self-refer. Um, and it's really important for you as an orthopedic surgeon, if you're listening to um, find out what brought the patient in. Um, were they referred by their hematologist or are they self-referring and why are they here? Um, what's their expectation from the visit? And is their hematologist aware that they're being seen? And for those of you who are consumers of healthcare that are listening, it's really important to have a relationship between your hematologist and your orthopedic surgeon if you're anticipating a surgery. So, um, you know, if you're thinking you want to see an orthopedist, talk to your hemophilia treatment center. Find out if there's somebody that they use um, or that they um, who has experience with with caring for patients with um, bleeding disorders. And as an orthopedist, you're gonna do the same thing you do with our hemophilia patients that you do with anybody. You're gonna do a clinical evaluation. You're gonna look at the joint. You're gonna watch the patient walk. You're gonna look at their range of motion, what their muscle tone is like. Um, if they've had a chronic problem, oftentimes they have muscle atrophy. Um, and then lastly, you're gonna do a radiologic evaluation and you're gonna do plain films like that um, one we saw earlier to determine whether or not this patient's a candidate possibly for total joint replacement. And then that upper panel, you can see that's an MRI and this is a 10 year old and this black on this view from the MRI is um, hemosiderin laden synovium. So you can see this young man already at age 10 has a lot of synovium in there. And this um, child may be a candidate for an arthroscopic synovectomy. So again, um, you wanna do the same full evaluation on a patient with a bleeding disorder that you would do on any patient that you're seeing. And once you've done the evaluation, then there's different levels of treatment options that are available to patients with um, bleeding disorders. We can look at non-invasive options, intermediate options, and then lastly, surgical options. So when we look at non-invasive options, um, we want to manage the bleeding episodes. And this um, really comes down to prophylaxis or that preventive treatment. And as Dr. Davis said, we really are prescribing this for our very young children. It doesn't hurt our adult patients is to go on prophylaxis, to break that cycle. You saw that cyclical bleed, synovial hypertrophy, 
you know, and then pinching it, bleeding again, the whole thing starts over and over again. So if we can start an adult patient on prophylaxis and stop that cycle, then we can get a better handle on what the appropriate treatment is going to be. And I can pretty much guarantee an adult patient that has never been on prophylaxis that goes on prophylaxis is going to find how much better they feel all, all the way around. Um, we also use standard rice, physical therapy, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of these. So I mentioned primary prophylaxis. Um, there was a study called the Joint Outcome Study that was done. Um, it was published in, um, by Marilyn Manko Johnson and several other hematologists around the country in the New England Journal in 2007. And that was really the landmark study done in the United States to show that patients with um, hemophilia benefited from prophylaxis and they um, had better um, outcomes than those children who were stuck, who were treated on demand or just when the bleeding episode happened. And then, um, as I mentioned, prophylaxis can be started at any age and it calms down the joint and, and breaks that cycle of rebleeding. Um, RISE can be done in any number of ways um, for those parents who are listening. Um, if you have very young children, frozen vegetables, great thing to put ice on. They're small, they bend around the joint, putting them in a Ziploc bag um, and draping them over the, the affected area can be very helpful. Um, and then compression using ACE bandages or some of the splints I'm gonna show you or supports in a minute. Um, and then elevating uh, the injured extremity above the level of the heart. Um, oftentimes people say, well, I'm elevating it. And I'm like, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm laying on the couch. And I'm like, well, do you have your leg up on pillows? No, I'm just laying on the couch, but it's elevated because it's not hanging down. Well, it's not elevated above the level of the heart. So we spend a lot of time really trying to teach patients. And it's painful sometimes when you get that, that um, leg or arm elevated initially, but eventually that it actually helps the pain subside. I can't say enough about physical therapy. I worked with a wonderful physical therapist at my HTC. I'm sure many of you all have really good physical therapists at your treatment centers as well. And those in orthopedics that are listening, I'm sure you have physical therapy practices that you work with that you um, trust and think do a good job. It, physical therapy can enhance the recovery following a joint or a muscle hemorrhage. Um, if you're going to do a lot of prophylaxis or a lot of um, aggressive physical therapy to recover from a joint bleed, um, for example, an iliopsoas bleed often requires a lot of physical therapy. We might want to continue prophylaxis very aggressively during that time when you're seeing physical therapy. And obviously, post-surgical rehabilitation following total joint replacement um, goes without saying physical therapy is essential to regain that motion following a surgical procedure. There are a lot of, and, and I can't even enumerate the number of different supportive devices and splints um, that are available out there. Um, a lot of patients will self-treat with some of these. And um, I encourage those of you who are listening that are, are consumers of healthcare, you know, talk to your treat, treatment center. Have a, even if it's just a one-time visit with a therapist to make sure you're using an appropriate splint. Sometimes splints can do more harm than good and splinting all the time can lead to muscle atrophy and we don't want to see that in our, our patients. So again, um, you know, talking with that physical therapist um, and your treatment center may not have a physical therapist on staff full time, but they have a physical therapist that they use for comprehensive clinic or someone that they like to refer to. We've heard a little bit about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, some treatment centers do not use these medications at all. Um, the treatment center I was at did use these, um, but we use them with extreme caution in our patients with bleeding disorders. And we never gave them to a patient who had a history of GI hemorrhage. Um, as Dr. O'Brien said, our, the COX-2 inhibitors um, prefer they have less um, interaction with the platelets and cause less bleeding. 
And then sometimes our patients, um, especially those patients with inhibitors, will benefit from um, systemic corticosteroids. Um, so a medrol dose pack or something like that may help to calm down um, the joint. <laughs> then there are intermediate options that can be used for the treatment of bleeding into joints. Um, and for those of you who are ER docs, you know, you see a patient comes in, they have a huge hot swollen joint, um, contacting ortho to come down and take a look at it. This is an appropriate time for joint aspiration, but it's very rare that patients present in this particular situation where they haven't had factor yet and a needle can be inserted after receiving factor um, and removing that blood. And this can help minimize um, that hemosiderin deposition and help facilitate a more rapid um, recovery from this joint bleed. Um, we also can use intraarticular steroid injections in our patients. Again, factor replacement is necessary beforehand. Um, we have had patients, there was one journal article um, several years ago about the use of hyaluronic acid in our patients with um, hemophilia, and it was beneficial, but it really only staved off total joint replacement for six months to a year. And then lastly, um, radiosynovial orthesis. This is the injection of a radioisotope into the joint. It's been done for longer than 35 years in the United States and Canada. Um, we don't do it as frequently as we used to. They use it a lot in third world countries because they don't have access to um, the factor concentrates that we have here in the United States. But um, it is still being done in, in a few places in the United States, um, LA Orthopedic. Um, I believe there's a center in Atlanta that's doing in Indiana. So there are places where you can be referred for this procedure. It's not as invasive as a surgical procedure. And basically what it does is sclerose or scar that synovial lining of the joint and thus decreases the um, frequency of recurrent hemorrhage. And this procedure is also used in patients with rheumatoid arthritis as well. And then lastly, there are surgical options that can be addressed for our patients with bleeding disorders. But I can't emphasize enough that these need to be done in conjunction with a hematologist. So it can either be the patient's hematologist. If you are not at a facility where the HTC is, consulting with a hematologist at your facility, hopefully that has some hemophilia management experience. If they don't, then they in turn can talk with the hemophilia treatment center and work out a, a plan for this patient to, who's undergoing surgery um, by you at a different facility. And then we like to have patients have factor and laboratory um, availability at the site. Patients with hemophilia and other bleeding disorders are not candidates for same-day surgery. So um, they, as, as much as it's being pushed by insurance companies and to um, have surgery done at, at these standalone surgical centers, really a patient with a bleeding disorder needs a little bit more um, attention, at least one night overnight stay and possibly even um, a couple of three nights overnight, depending on which surgical procedure the patient has. It's definitely a team approach between the hematologist, the surgeon, the inpatient facility, the physical therapist. And we um, really have to look at, do the benefits outweigh potential risks for these patients? And the patient needs to have realistic expectations for the surgery. If they think they have a total knee replacement and are going to go out and run a marathon in six months, that's probably not a realistic expectation. Now, there's always going to be the outlier out there that's going to prove me wrong and have their total knee and then go run a marathon. But in general, patients need to have realistic expectations. They need to know what they're, um, if they're going to have an increase in range of motion if they're gonna be able to increase their activity level, and if this surgery is gonna decrease their pain. So these are things that are important to patients, um, but they also need to be realistic. <laughs>
the potential surgical procedures that are often done in our patients with bleeding disorders are arthroscopic synovectomy, going in through with the scope and taking out that, that hypertrophy lining. Sometimes it's so proliferative that it needs to be done open. Um, so same procedure, but actually opening the joint up and kind of scraping all of that, that out. Um, fusion or arthrodesis, and that's um, you know, cementing a joint together so it doesn't move anymore. Um, sometimes that's done when um, you, there aren't other options that can be done, um, but it's also done predominantly in ankles. Um, up until more recently, um, total ankles were um, hit and miss as to how effective they were in our bleeding disorder patients because they were being done in patients who were young. Um, so um, sometimes when those fail, patients ended up with, with fusions. Um, but total joint replacements have come a long way. Um, we primarily do total knees and total hips, but we can do total joint replacements in shoulders, ankles, and elbows today with very good results in our um, hemophilia and bleeding disorder populations. As I said, it is a team approach, and from the medical and nursing um, side, we're going to do a full assessment along, and oftentimes include our social worker, if there's one present at the treatment center, to offer some support and um, lend any ideas in terms of how we're going to manage. We need to first and foremost look at the initial timing um, of the surgery. You know, if you are the primary caregiver, for example, of your school-aged children, perhaps waiting until summer when they're out of school. Of course, that doesn't mean much today because who knows when kids are in school or out of school and homeschooling and you know virtual schooling, but looking at the, the time of the surgery um, to make sure that you are available and can take that chunk of time out. Because this isn't, it's not like go to the hospital and get your total knee and a week later you're back to your normal regimen. That's not what's gonna happen. It's a, it's a a minimum for a total joint replacement of really about a six week time period before you're back up and running to where you were before surgery. You need to have a good knowledge and understanding of your bleeding disorder and of the surgical procedure. So we spend a lot of time educating patients. Again, they need to have lab work and they need to know what the expected outcome of the surgery is. And lastly, what we found at our treatment center was you know, we wanted patients to be motivated and have the ability to comply with their post-op regimen. And oftentimes we did prehab. So we had patients come in before a joint surgery um, to visit with physical therapy and get uh, a regimen established so that we knew that they would do the follow-up after their surgery. And lastly, and this is where the, the social worker often comes into play, is discharge planning when the patient's gonna go home? Is there somebody at home that can help care for them? Do they need to go to an extended care facility? They're going to an extended care facility following um, hospitalization. Um, how is their factor gonna be paid for? Who's gonna administer their factor if they don't do it themselves? So all of those things need to be addressed before jumping into a surgical procedure. Again, this is why it's a collaboration between that orthopedic surgeon and his staff and the hematologist or hemophilia treatment center and the staff there. So in summary, um, as I said before, hemophilic arthropathy is the most common complication related to hemophilia and bleeding disorders. And we view our orthopedic surgeons as an integral member of the patient's management team. And keeping in mind that there, we don't have to jump into surgery right away, that there are both surgical and non-surgical methods to manage um, this hemophilic arthropathy in our patients, and that they, these um, surgical procedures can be done safely in persons with hemophilia. Um, sometimes we hear patients come in and say, well, I saw an orthopedic surgeon, but he said because I had hemophilia, I couldn't have surgery. And we know that that's not true. We can take you through or a patient with a bleeding disorder through um, a total joint replacement, an arthroscopic synovectomy, an ACL repair, whatever they need, but it does require coordination and a lot of pre-planning. So with that, I'm gonna stop and open it up if there are any questions. I know we're probably getting close to ending this morning, but um, 
If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. That was excellent, Sue. I appreciate that. Um, everything we wanted to hear. Um, excellent. Just excellent. Thank you so much. So does anybody have any questions? Go ahead and... Um...